Hello, everyone. Uh, the voice you just heard was Mitch Tensos, a colleague at the C.D. Howe Institute, who has helped to convene this meeting. And uh, I'm pleased to start by saying to Mitch and, and to uh, colleagues who run the events um, how grateful we are that they staged the ones that are in person and then this one virtually uh, with uh, Jack joining us from Calgary and, and people uh, joining uh, at least from British Columbia to New Brunswick. Uh, and and we've got an attendee from the Northwest Territories, at least one that I know of. So uh, virtual has its defects, but it does allow us all to get together, uh, notwithstanding geography. And it's uh, great to be here for uh, today's uh, Mintz seminar, uh, featuring none other than Jack Mintz. Uh, I, I look forward to introducing uh, Jack himself uh, properly, but I should say a word or two about the seminar itself. Uh, Jack as many of you will know, uh, was CEO of the CD Howe Institute for a very successful uh, term. And when he uh, stepped down, uh, in uh, we raised some money uh, to support an annual lecture in his name. And uh, it has been a marquee event in, in the CD Howe Institute's annual calendar ever since. We've had some outstanding uh, scholars uh, talk to us. We've actually had Larry Kotlikoff twice. Uh, we've had Alan Auerbach, uh, we've had uh, Jim Hines, uh, Bill Gale, uh, Ed Glazer. Uh, it's a it's a very impressive list uh, on the academic side. Uh, Alberto Alessina and Marty Eichenbaum, uh, and, and we've also uh, had uh, key officials, including from the Department of Finance, uh, Cavin, Canada Revenue Agency, and practitioners as well. So, uh, certainly honoring the tradition of uh, bringing people who in who know a lot about fiscal and tax policy and uh, uh, have great insights to share. Uh, and uh, when you're thinking about fiscal policy and, and tax policy and insights, uh, Jack himself is right at the top of the list. So uh, having run the event in over so many years with so many distinguished speakers, it's a great pleasure to have Jack uh, himself joining us uh, for the um, uh, seminar in his name. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit more than an impresario uh, on this occasion, because I do have a few opening remarks that I hope will be uh, motivational before turning the stage over uh, to Jack himself. Uh, but in order to uh, avoid too many hiccups in the program, why don't I just uh, uh, say, well, first of all, Jack, uh, welcome. Uh, please say hello to everyone. And uh, I had to unmute. Uh, anyway, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here and look forward to the discussion. Well, Jack, it is a pleasure to have you. Uh, it's appropriate on this occasion, even though I'm sure uh, everyone knows you by reputation and many personally, to say uh, that Jack is currently the President's Fellow of the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. Uh, he was the Palmer Chair and Founding Director of the school uh, from January 2008 until uh, June of 2015. Uh, that was what he did after being uh, CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. Uh, Jack is very active in the community. He's very sought after professionally. He's got a worldwide reputation for his work uh, on tax policy. Uh, and among many uh, distinctions, he became a member of the Order of Canada in 2015. So widely recognized for his accomplishments and certainly very uh, fondly remembered here at the C.D. Howe Institute, including by me, having had the pleasure of work, working alongside Jack uh, during his tenure as CEO. Uh, as an outstanding leader of the C.D. Howe Institute, uh, who who used uh, it, uh, among other things, as, as a platform for um, getting his views about tax and fiscal policy out uh, happily. And I'm now sort of segueing to a few opening remarks I want to make, Jack, uh, if I may. Uh, uh, his advice has been heeded in the past and uh, very much to Canada's advantage. So, um, Jack, thank you for joining us. Uh, the program uh, for for everyone is, I, I'm going to say a few remarks that I think will be a bit motivational, maybe a bit depressing, because they certainly underline the need for us to do something different on economic policy, on fiscal policy, and on tax policy. Uh, and then I will turn the floor over to Jack for his opening remarks. We will then go uh, to a Q&A session. Uh, we have a, a, a very long list of participants. It's great to have so many. Uh, it might make keeping order a little bit more challenging than usual. What I'll do uh, uh, in advance so that you can check if you're not familiar with WebEx uh, is say that we will take questions on the Q&A screen. So if you're not seeing a button for it uh, open in front of you right now, please look down bottom right 
of your screen, you should see the three dot menu there. If you click on that, uh, it'll bring up the Q&A option. If you chat a question, I may catch it, uh, but there are no promises. If you can put it in the Q&A screen, that'll make it a little easier to moderate uh, the discussion. Uh, so moving right along in the interest of time, because I know there will be a lot of discussion. I don't want to squeeze Jack any more than I did already. Uh, just a few opening remarks uh, from me. Uh, Mitch is handling the slides, so you're going to hear the dreaded uh, next slide, please. Uh, but let me uh, uh, again welcome you and just say, Mitch, if you can move over to the first slide, just a little bit of motivation for what we're talking about. Uh, people talk a lot about whether we're in a recession or not. Well, um, GDP, as you can see, has been uh, uh, flatlining after a not, in retrospect, very impressive rebound after COVID. And in fact, uh, when you look a, a slightly longer term, you can see that uh, GDP was slightly growing in line with the labor force, uh, but uh, 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 you know maybe catching up a little bit until the middle of the last decade. Uh, and since then, it's been falling consistently short, and the gap has really opened up a lot. Uh, the labor force figures that you see here are the ones that you get from Statistics Canada's labor force survey, but uh, with a bit of a modification uh, from me, uh, as some will be following, there's a, a debate right now about what the right numbers are, because the population figures and the labor force figures have been diverging quite markedly, especially because with all the flows of temporary uh, workers. So I did a little bit of a tweak here to avoid some of the divergence that's happened over the last two years. Uh, labor force growth just a little a tad faster here than what you see in the labor force survey. Uh, but it's very clear, even without that adjustment, you'd see much the same thing. Uh, labor force rising very rapidly, GDP flatlining. I'm assuming here that the fourth quarter of 2023 is the average of the bank economist forecast. So about a half a percent growth. Mitch, if you can show the next uh, slide, please. This is showing the GDP lines identical to what I just showed you. Uh, this time, the uh, gold line is the population line. Uh, and as I prefigured already, it's been growing very rapidly while GDP has been flatlining. And if you look further back, you can see that GDP outpaced population growth, which of course is what you want in any kind of developing economy with living standards. So if I combine uh, the ratios of those two things you've just seen, uh, uh, GDP and the labor force, and then GDP and population, uh, you get what's on the next slide, uh, looking at uh, uh, output product G GDP per potential worker, so a measure of labor productivity, and then GDP per person. And this is a very distressing picture to be seeing. Uh, we're in decline. I mean, on a per person basis, we are in a recession. Uh, output per person is down about 2.4% year over year. And as you can see, uh, drawing a line back to before COVID, uh, living standards have scarcely grown in Canada uh, over the course of nearly a decade now. GDP per potential worker, uh, same thing. We are simply not uh, performing anything like we need to uh, for competitiveness reasons and, and to raise our living standards. Now, there are a number of ways of cutting into this. Uh, I do want to just highlight one that I think is worth uh, attention. Uh, before turning it over to Jack. Mitch, if you can show us the first slide, or the next slide, please. This is uh, in real dollars. These are the investment figures that you get out of the GDP uh, figures in Canada. Uh, so the quarterly numbers that we uh, wait for every time and the, the Bank of Canada watches when deciding what to do with interest rates. Um, in, in real terms, per worker, as calculated in the, in the chart that I just showed you about the labor force, this is what's been happening to different categories of capital investment in Canada. Um, structures way off, uh, partly because if you, if you go back to 2014 and see what happened after that, we had a big oil price decline. And of course, COVID uh, affected all forms of investment. Um, but what you see is a very muted recovery, uh, even in structures. And when you look at machinery and equipment, it's a very depressing prospect. Many people think that machinery and equipment is particularly important for productivity growth. Uh, and on a per worker basis, uh, we've basically gone nowhere for about a decade now. Uh, and intellectual property products, a slightly better performance. You can see a little bit of an upward trend in that line. Uh, but nothing uh, very impressive, really, especially when you consider how quickly intellectual property products depreciate. So the, I think it's the last slide I'm going to show you, uh, or, or the last pair of slides. Mitch, if you can just advance it next, 
Uh, this is what happens to the capital stock when you've got investment rates that low. Again, looking at the capital stock per worker, uh, Statistics Canada separates non-residential structures into engineering type stuff, which is particularly uh, uh, important in a natural resource-based economy like ours. Uh, then you can see machinery and equipment, non-residential buildings and intellectual property products. All these lines are going down. All these lines have been going down for years now. We actually have a declining capital stock uh, overall per worker, and each category of capital is declining because we're not investing at a rate sufficient to offset, to keep up with the growth of the workforce and to keep up with things uh, wearing out and going obsolete. Um, is this happening elsewhere or is it unique to Canada? If you uh, can go to the next slide, Mitch, uh, what you'll see is that in uh, Canada, the, the, the most prominent line there, uh, our rebound in investment per potential worker is not as strong as what we've seen elsewhere in the OECD. Uh, since the over the course of the last decade, uh, there's been a big gap that's opened up between us and OECD countries other than Canada and the United States. And the United States is really almost in a category of its own, uh, very steep upward line compared to us. Uh, I think it is now the last slide I want to show you because it really sets uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the ratio of the other OECD and Canadian lines and the US and Canadian lines. What this shows you is for every dollar of investment per potential worker per member of the workforce in the US or in the other OECD countries, how many cents did the typical Canadian worker get? Uh, I like this chart because it sort of speaks to competitiveness. Um, one of the things that, uh, I mean, what jumps right out at you is that uh, per worker in Canada, we are equipping our workers far less well uh, than workers elsewhere. It is going to be very hard for us to compete with the United States uh, if we're only getting about 60 cents uh, per dollar of, that's invested per worker in the United States, and particularly with machinery and equipment and intellectual products. Uh, property products as low as they are. Uh, but the other thing I mentioned that Jack's advice has been heated in the past. Um, if you look over the course of the late 1990s through to the middle of the last decade, you can see that our ratios, both with respect to the other OECD countries and the United States were improving. And briefly, we even matched what was happening elsewhere in the OECD uh, before the collapse that happened uh, uh, after 2014. So. Uh, when when people say you can't do anything, uh, we don't know how to do it. Canada's always been bad. Uh, my my answer to that is no. That's actually not true. Uh, we did have a period when we were outperforming, when we were catching up, uh, and uh, uh, we can do it again. Uh, but we sure need to because uh, these latest numbers uh, speak to either or both of businesses simply not seeing the same opportunities that they do in Canada, uh, perhaps for tax policy reasons that we'll get into, perhaps for uh, other reasons, uh, or that productivity growth, weak productivity growth is simply not spurring uh, businesses to invest. Uh, so uh, there are two ways of cutting into this. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanna say, Mitch, if you could just advance one more slide, uh, is that uh, tax policy can certainly help. It has in the past. Uh, lately, it hasn't been as good, but we've seen some uh, key examples elsewhere. Uh, and uh, Jack, I hope I set the stage for you and didn't talk too long because we uh, very much look forward to what you have to say about our current situation and how we could make it better. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bill. And uh, you certainly did set up uh, what I think is uh, a major concern now I think Canada should really be worried about, and that is our falling GDP per capita, real GDP per capita. In fact, we're now at about 70% of US levels where we were close to 90%, uh, uh, I forget which year, but it was back, you know over 10 years ago anyway. And so that's, uh, I think we are in, um, I think we are in a very serious situation. And when you have declining GDP per capita, that means uh, less money that could be paid to uh, to people uh, in terms of wages and salaries. It also means less tax revenues coming into the government. Uh, there's all sorts of negatives with it, but I think the one that I worry about uh, is the potential for an eventual brain drain, uh, both brain and investment drain uh, to the United States particularly, uh, as well as other countries. And and we are. I think we really need to look at our whole uh, agenda. Uh, and I think I don't think there's any silver bullet. You'll see there's an article I have uh, that's online today uh, on productivity and uh, you know and every you know there's lots of different ideas that people have to improve our productivity. Uh, and I think there's 
there are a lot of things on the agenda to deal with. And uh, obviously today I'm going to talk about the tax side, but it is only it is only one of what I think a whole agenda of things that are needed. And if I was going to call that an agenda, I, I would say Canada's open for business. Uh, would, and what sort of things we need to do for Canada to be open for business. And I think that's, uh, I think there's a whole list of items I would put under that. And uh, obviously taxation uh, is one part of it. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, about some of the th concerns I have with respect to taxation. Uh, I'm not going to give you my preferred solutions at this point. I do have some ideas, but I won't uh, I won't go into that. But I want to kind of uh, uh, escalate what I think are are key issues that that we need to deal with from a tax point of view uh, to improve our productivity. And one of the first things I want to mention is a very interesting. Uh, Conference that the CDL had uh, last summer on um, on uh, tax reform, you know, celebrating uh, 50 years since uh, the 1972 reform, which was a very dramatic uh, reform, and then also the uh, uh, the Technical Committee on Business Taxation, uh, the corporate tax reform that actually followed in 2000, that did lead to very significant changes in the corporate tax uh, over 12 years' time. We did it incrementally, uh, but it did take place over over a very long time, uh, and we stopped in 12 to, uh, 2012. Uh, we haven't done much since 2012 with respect to uh, the corporate tax side, but at least we did bring down uh, the effective tax rate on capital, uh, which at back in 2000, we were one of the highest in the OECD, uh, to bring it down to close to the average. Uh, in fact, we're now falling above the average a little bit, especially after since US tax reform, but. Certainly, we're not. We're in the middle. Let's say, uh, in terms of that, we don't. We're not a star you know, when it comes to tax policy, uh, like a country like Ireland or or Estonia. Uh, but we're not. Uh, uh, but at least we're not uh, something like the Congo, which I've estimated their effective tax rate, and 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 some other countries that have very high high effective tax rates on capital. Um, now, one of the things that came out of the CD Howe conference last last uh, summer, which was done by Munir Sheikh, was that he showed that actually uh, out of the G7 countries, Canada has uh, has the most redistributive tax and transfer system uh, amongst all the G7 countries. In other words, we have we have uh, done a, a remarkable job actually uh, trying to provide a social safety net uh, for uh, for low income people. And through our transfer system and our tax system, we do a lot of redistribution. In fact, we do a lot more. We do more de redistribution uh, by comparing the pre-tax and post-tax Gini coefficients, as it's called, uh, and uh, uh, than any other G7 country. And I think that's really quite interesting uh, that we do do that. Uh, however, uh, we have uh, had actually pretty miserable uh, economic growth, as Bill's already outlined um, and and shown. Uh, but also, when you look at the forecasts uh, that the OECD has done of GDP per capita, uh, just within this decade till 2030, Canada is going to be lagging almost every other OECD country. Uh, and certainly, we are seeing that right now with falling GDP per capita last year, and it will happen again in 2024 because we're not going to have that much growth in GDP, uh, real GDP, and we're going to have still population boom going on here. So you can see right away that our real GDP per capita is going to drop uh, in 2024 for a second year straight. So I think we I think we do have to worry uh, about uh, about our direction. And I think the big question, and this is one that I think is challenging uh, for the tax system, is that I think we need to put growth back into the agenda of tax policy. Uh, it can't be just redistribution. And so I'm going to talk about some of the issues that I think are relevant. But if I was going to do another tax reform today, it would be one that would be relatively distributionally neutral, um, but at, but at the same time would have pro growth uh, as its main as its main goal, and and I think that's possible to do uh, through various uh, rate and and broad you know base broadening type changes, uh, but I but I do think that uh, we need to put growth back on the agenda uh, for tax policy. And why is that? Well, I'm going to go through uh, four specific concerns that I have. Uh, the first one is uh, we don't have a very good mix of taxes compared to a lot of countries. Uh, if you compare us to, uh, you know, let's say other uh, other countries around the world, actually Canada 
relies more on personal income taxes than, than many other countries to fund uh, our public goods and services. Um, and in fact, uh, as Bev Dalby has shown relentlessly in many papers that he is, as he has written, uh, is that the uh, personal income tax now actually probably has the highest marginal economic cost per dollar raised, even more than the corporate income tax now. And that's mainly because of the increase in the top rate uh, that's happened in, in Canada. And if you compare our tax system, we also rely less on sales taxes, uh, general sales taxes, uh, and we also rely less on payroll taxes. Uh, and uh, and again, those are that's just simply in terms of the mix we have. And so obviously an important question is whether we need a change in that mix in the way that we try to fund our, our public services. I should mention the property tax actually has a low has a low marginal cost, economic cost per dollar raised, uh, although that doesn't mean that all types of property taxes have a low one. I would argue that land transfer taxes and some of these crazy ideas like the vacancy tax, which I won't go into depth on, which I've been working on lately, also uh, have very high economic costs associated with them, uh, unlike unlike the property, the general property tax, which gives you a guide really what municipalities, if they're going to raise property taxes, they really should do it in terms of the annual property tax if they want to minimize the economic distortions uh, that are involved uh, with it. Now, um, that's the first point I want to make is that we really, I think part of the growth agenda is to look at a, a shift uh, in the mix. And again, the question is whether you can do that shift in a distributionally ne neutral manner or one that does not undermine completely uh, the way that uh, we use the tax system for redistribution. And of course, that could require might require compensations in terms of the transfer payment system that we have at the same time. The second concern I have is the high marginal tax rates that we have at, at the personal level uh, that I think has potentially uh, significant impacts, not only on work participation and uh, hours worked, uh, savings rates, uh, ability of people to save money for their retirement, um, but, also, uh, but also with respect to uh, potential migration of people, which matters more and more these days. Uh, and in fact, there's a number of economic studies to suggest that we should be more concerned about that migration. And I should point out that I think uh, I'm very disappointed actually in the kind of research that's done in Canada uh, on migration, because there's a very natural thing that we could look at. If there's everybody when they leave the country or when they come into the country, there's a little box that they check, whether they have this is their last tax filing or whether this is their first one. And if we analyze that in a lot more depth, we might understand how much taxes might be actually impacting mobility of people when you have like a grand experiment in Alberta, where in one year you had the top rate going up four points at the federal level and five points at the provincial level, nine points in total. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about people who have moved to the United States and elsewhere, uh, but we, we don't, everyone says, well, we don't have the real data. Well, the real data is sitting there and it'd be about time that somebody really exploited that data and try to understand migration better than we have so far. Now, uh, leaving, leaving that aside, when you look at Canada, we have the third highest marginal effect uh, top rate uh, of the G7 countries. The only one that's higher, the two that are higher is slightly higher than ours. Uh, we're at 53.5% are Japan and France. Um, but there's a big difference between Japan and France and Canada. In Canada, our top rate comes in at 2.7 times the average wage, according to OECD data. Uh, for Japan, it's about nine times the average wage. And for J France, it's 14 times the average wage. So the top rate really applies more to the very rich in, in Japan and, uh, and France compared to Canada, uh, where our top rate really applies. And for an individual uh, at 230,000, sounds like a lot of money, but if anyone knows anything, a single learner with 230,000 or $250,000 in income, living in Toronto, you're not exactly rich. I mean, you're not poor, but you're not rich. Uh, in fact, you're just getting by with the kind of housing costs and, and other things that are, that are involved. So I think that, uh, you know, we, we, and when you look at the other countries, G7 countries, they're all below 50% top rates uh, uh, as well. So uh, we are really out of line when it comes to G7 countries, 
But I do worry about the overall impact of that. And then the other side, uh, the low income side, we know that marginal tax rates can be very high uh, for many low income people because of clawbacks uh, for various uh, transfer programs. And every time we introduce a new transfer program, we introduce a new clawback. And so these clawbacks get stacked upon each other, which is even worse. And, and so I think we, we, we keep doing uh, and adding to the marginal tax rate, uh, which is affecting, I think, a lot of lower income people in terms of their incentive to, let's say, undertake part time work uh, or to uh, or to put in, uh, you know, or to become full time workers instead of part time workers, et cetera. Uh, so I think those are, are, are issues that I think we need to be a lot more worried about in terms of our productivity challenge. So that's the second one. Uh, the third one are the increasing number of distortions that are coming back into the tax system, both at the individual level uh, and uh, as, as well at the corporate level, and even in the GST that, and the HST that we so fondly say is the best tax in the world. Well, it ain't the best tax in the world. As uh, Michael Smart's uh, very good work had shown in the past, is that the GST is full of holes and special exemptions. In fact, we keep introducing new ones uh, lately, like for rental uh, apartment construction. Um, and, and actually, uh, we are, the efficiency of our uh, GST in terms of how much real consumption we tend to collect is only about 50% uh, of what is possible. And, and, that, and you compare that to like New Zealand, which as everybody knows, is the poster child of, of of consumption taxes, they tax almost all consumption, uh, close to 100%. What does that mean? Well, because of if we were doing a revenue neutral reform, instead of a federal GST rate of 5%, we could have 3%. Uh, and if we had a you know a, a total base broadening, my main point is that we keep talking about raising the GST rate uh, or moving towards the GST, but in the meantime, we're getting a GST that is getting distortionary more and more over time. And I think we need to pay some more attention to that because since 1991, we haven't done uh, that much attention to, to it. Now, of course, under the personal income tax, there's all sorts of, of, uh, of preferences uh, for capital gains are uh, less heavily taxed than the top uh, dividend tax rate. Uh, we have still uh, labor-sponsored venture capital credits. We have a number of other, uh, other items in, in uh, you know, of, of special uh, credits that we give to people. Um, and then we have, of course, uh, you know, the marginal tax rates issue that I've already raised. On the corporate tax, uh, since 2012, when we uh, got the tax rate down, the federal provincial corporate tax rate down to 26%, and we've eliminated capital taxes, uh, we've been kind of reversing ourselves in terms of distortions because we also broaden the tax base or we try to make it more like economic income. We try to match capital cost allowances with economic depreciation. For example, uh, you know, we got scaled back, you know, eliminated investment tax credits to a large extent. But now we're starting to get differential corporate income tax rates re reintroduced. You know, we did eliminate the difference between manufacturing and non-manufacturing at the federal level and, and most of the provinces. But now we are reintroducing differential rates, this time on finance. Uh, clean energy is half the rate. Uh, as you know, there's added complexity, added distortions that uh, that happen in the system when you do that. Uh, we are also, uh, we are also uh, introducing a whole bunch of tax credits for, uh, you know, politically favored uh, type activities, including uh, obviously clean energy and uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, whether some of those work or they don't work, we haven't really had a good discussion about that uh, and in terms of their overall impact and, and distortions associated with that. Things that we need to understand better than, than simply just throwing out these credits all the time. And so I think, uh, you know, we are actually uh, reintroducing a number of distortions and now inflation is higher. So we have to remember that inflation actually ends up distorting profits uh, and, uh, and also creates distortions in the corporate tax system. But we also have to, we have to remember this inflation when it comes to taxable capital income uh, also increases the effective tax rate on savings. Uh, and and in differential ways. So that's another uh, distortion that, that uh, is introduced in, in the system. Um, so uh, so that I, third item is all these increased distortions. Some of the work that we've done on the corporate tax side is the distortions have almost doubled uh, over uh, uh, over the past um, uh, over the past uh, ten year, ten years 
uh, since uh, since 2012. Um, and then finally, uh, complexity. The system is uh, obviously getting more complex. I mean, we're for large corporations. You know, we're now gone into this uh, the new OECD uh, globe rules, which uh, are highly complex and are going to add tremendous compliance costs to to companies. But luckily, it's only the very large companies, so most taxpayers aren't going to be aware of it. Uh, but still, uh, the complexity is just overwhelming when you look at the application of these rules. But that's not the only one. We we still have uh, a number of um, a number of areas that uh, you know we are introducing new taxes that have significant compliance costs associated with them. Uh, yesterday, I just happened to have a discussion with somebody here in Calgary, where I'm at uh, in my hotel. Uh, he comes from Vancouver. He was railing on about the vacant tax in in Vancouver. Because he's, he says, for some reason, I'm getting audited. He says, I, I don't go away. I've been living in my place. And then he told me about the pages of stuff that he has to put together for the, for the city on, on, you know, for, as part of the audit, including all of his last year's utility bills. Um, and which makes me kind of wonder why doesn't the city just simply look up the utility bills? They can do that very easily without having to people to provide that kind of information. Well, there is a whole bunch of issues that are uh, evolved in terms of the complexity, but also, you know, with the new technology that we are uh, draw, uh, developing, including our artificial intelligence, I think we have great opportunities to save compliance and administrative costs for governments uh, by uh, by doing things a little differently in terms of the way that we collect taxes. For many years, I remember Jamie Golombic has made the argument about moving to a to a system more akin to the United Kingdom, where at least many taxpayers could uh, could file, would have their filing done for them by the government, uh, as opposed to uh, them having to do it. They could always check it themselves, but uh, it would be tremendous savings since the government's already collecting all this information. And and so there's many things that we can think of. I think that could could help uh, reduce compliance and uh, and. Uh, Compliance costs for taxpayers and administrative costs for governments as well. Um, so those are four areas where I think the tax system is really impeding productivity and, and having an impact. Uh, the bad mix of taxes that we're currently relying on, um, the high marginal effective tax rates that I think are, are quite problematical, uh, and, and uh, the distortions in, in the tax system, uh, uh, including differential taxes on businesses, different types of business activities, et cetera. Um, the complexity that we are increasingly introducing, uh, which especially along the requirements for auditing of, of, of taxes that don't necessarily collect that much revenue. And so you sort of ask, why are we doing the tax in the first place uh, when the administrative and complex, uh, compliance costs become uh, significant relative to the revenues that are being raised? Uh, all those sorts of things I think are uh, we really need to do in terms of, uh, of a tax reform agenda. Let me leave one final thought, and that is what kind of tax reform should we be thinking about? Do we do a big bang with a major change to the tax system or, or do it incrementally? Um, let me give you an example on the, on the corporate income tax. Uh, the corporate income tax, uh, you know, we could continue making changes as we've had to the corporate income tax, maybe cut back the small business deduction, uh, lower the corporate rate, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe even out the capital gains tax rate with the dividend tax rate. Uh, you know, there's a number of uh, measures that we could do to improve the taxation of capital income uh, in Canada. Uh, but basically using the current system as we have, much of, it, much of it will be incremental. My argument is that, yes, uh, there may be some positive things associated with that, uh, but it will be incremental. Uh, it really won't, I think, move the dial very much in terms of productivity. If you really want to get a big change, then we should be looking at a big tax reform. Uh, some of them include, for example, Robin Bodeway's recommendation of going to um, a, uh, uh, a tax on uh, um, cash flow for corporations where they can expense their capital. They don't get interest deductibility, but they uh, get to uh, expense their capital. There's other approaches to, uh, to having a rent tax. Um, uh, or it could be the one that I've suggested, which is Kind of like having a a tax on distributed profits, uh, which is kind of akin gets it can be kin, similar to the cash flow tax, but not quite, uh, because uh, uh, because it would be basically taxing profits as they are distributed to investors, which is 
what Estonia does today. Though, those would, but anyway, those kinds of reforms we'd have to really evaluate. But the big question is, would you would you end up having a significant impact on productivity as opposed to incremental change uh, with the corporate tax? But of course, if you do a major change to the tax system, they are easy. They're not easy to sell because because it's all the time with tax reform. The the people that lose or pay more tax scream, and the ones that benefit you don't hear from very much. And tax reform is always a bit of like a contract between governments and people, uh, and, it, and it's always a tough thing to change if you want to go ahead in that direction. So, Bill, I think I'll, I'll stop here, but my point is I think tax reform is needed in Canada. There are four areas that I think we need to address that are significant problems. Uh, whether we do it through big tax reform or minor tax reforms, uh, but at least I think we need some sort of direction in what we're doing currently because we have a big problem on our side now, and that's that falling GDP per capita. That is something that is a real serious issue that can't continue for very long. Anyway, thank you. You're muted, Bill. Sorry to uh, do this, the the, the uh, mime act there. I was thanking you and uh, saying it's very sobering, but you've also given us a lot of uh, insights uh, relevant for potential remedies. Um, I'll just remind everyone uh, the Q and A field may not be showing uh, as your screen is currently set up, but if you go to the three dot menu at the bottom right. Uh, you should be able to get um, the screen up where you can uh, put your questions in. Uh, I don't see any right now, Jack. I might just uh, uh, start us off uh, really close to where you ended um, and, and invite you to say a comment about the environment for uh, tax reform. You made the important point about revenue neutrality or ideally even um, uh, being able to uh, take a hit on revenue for a while in order to help the medicine go down. Um, uh, clearly, where fiscal policy is right now doesn't create the most promising environment for that. So does that affect the way you're thinking about the sequencing of reforms, how big to try and go in the short run? Yeah, I think there's a, uh, I didn't really say very much about revenue neutrality. I said distribution of neutrality, but uh, didn't say very much about revenue neutrality. Um, of course, that depends on uh, you know what we mean by neutrality. I remember uh, working with Bev Dolby on some Alberta tax changes. Bev looked at uh, corporate rate uh, reductions and said, "Look, you can't just look at the corporate tax revenues. You also have to look at all the other revenues that get impacted uh, by having more growth by cutting the the rate." And actually, um, you know, he had some pretty interesting results uh, as uh, that he showed in terms of the overall uh, revenue impact. So. Uh, I think that's something that we need to first uh, try to make sure we understand what we mean by revenue neutrality when you do make tax changes. Uh, I think getting specifically to your question, uh, we are entering into uh, a slowdown in the economy. Uh, whether we end up with a recession is another story. Of course, we already had one quarter of negative GDP growth uh, and uh, another quarter, you'll see the headlines. Uh, Canada is now in a recession, but that, as we know, it's more complicated defining a recession because, as the MBR points out, you look at a number of factors like employment and, and other things to decide whether you really truly have a recession or not. Um, but uh, if we, but I think most people would agree that we're uh, with the continuing interest rates and uh, uh, and and the uh, potential of of uh, you know the impact uh, that that's going to have on the economy that we're we're going to be looking at a slowdown. That, of course, makes the fiscal uh, situation more difficult. You could take the attitude while well, running a bit of a deficit is okay in terms of propping up the economy while you're doing this tax reform. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, you some people might say maybe we should try to raise taxes uh, in order to, um, you know, in order to deal with uh, deal with the reform. Uh, now, I, I'm 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 of the view that probably revenue neutrality is a better way to start. And the reason I always like revenue neutrality is that, you know, the purpose of taxation in the first place is to fund government public services. So if you really want to lower taxes or raise them, it's a matter of how much money you want to spend in terms of, of public services. Um, 
But the nice thing when you're talking about revenue neutrality is that you can really focus on the tax structure. What, what changes in the tax structure do we need to do that would be pro-growth? And I'd like to start with revenue neutrality just so that we could really focus on the tax structure and, and how much revenue we want to raise then I think is an adjustment given that we once you feel you have a tax structure that you're happy with. Well, thank you. And with any luck, uh, some reigning in federal spending would make that a little easier to achieve with a decent bottom line. Uh, a lot of excellent questions have come in. I'm going to jump uh, to the one about the difference in recent economic performance between the United States and Canada. Uh, and um, because it really uh, speaks to a question that's still quite controversial in the United States about the effects of the U.S. tax reform. Our questioner asked why have corporate tax cuts worked for some countries. Uh, he mentions Ireland, as Estonia, as you did, Jack, but also the United States with its big reform. Uh, a, a quick view of the data seems to suggest some, that it had a positive impact. What's your take on that and uh, its implications for Canada? Yeah, I forgot to mention the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is another example of a very dramatic reform. I mean, they lowered the federal corporate income tax rate from 35 to 21 percent, plus making a whole bunch of base broadening changes uh, at the same time. Um, in the case of uh, uh, U.S., there have been some recent studies that have come up to show that actually it did have a very positive impact on investment. Uh, and, um, and uh, you know, after 20, 2017. So, uh, I would say that you know that reform did accomplish what it was hoping to accomplish uh, in, ter in terms of investment and productivity, uh, and uh, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, I think I think that probably was one of the the biggest issues that the U.S. needed to uh, address for many years. Even the Democrats understood that there had to be a corporate rate reduction. They wouldn't have done such a dramatic change, although they still would have. They were still talking about thirty-five down to twenty-eight percent. Um, so, but it was a but it was a very successful uh, reform in that sense, and uh, and it is an example of a of a big change uh, type reform, uh, and uh, but it seems that uh, uh, in the U.S. it was more easily to it was more easy to make that kind of change, and it seems that we can in Canada. We when you look at the changes in the corporate tax system from two thousand to twenty twelve, and you add it all up, we really made big change to the corporate tax system. Over that 12 year period, and so I think we are capable of, of, of going in a certain direction uh, and maybe that's the Canadian way. So, um, but at least we, we had a sense of where we're going. I remember when we did come out with a technical committee report in 1997, we recommended the corporate rate reduction at the federal level uh, of, uh, if I recall, close to 8% and uh, uh, in the end, it even went further. But the main point was that. Uh, you know, there was a, a significant change, uh, including the elimination of capital taxes for non financial companies, the finance companies still face that. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, it does look, uh, I mean, it, there are many links in the chain of cause and effect here, and uh, some of it is a bit, uh, circular, uh, virtuous versus vicious circles, but it certainly does seem as though things moved in the right direction uh, as those changes were occurring and, and shortly afterwards. A couple of questioners have raised uh, federal provincial uh, issues, and um, uh, uh, one questioner asked about the degree to which we need federal leadership in the area versus what provinces might be able to do on their own, uh, and uh, uh, that was from uh, Alex Laurent. Rebecca Langstaff asked a very a similarly motivated question uh, with provinces being limited in their scope of action. Uh, it's it's a complicated area to address, but uh, when you think of provinces perhaps striking out on their own, maybe even in desirable directions, where might that leave us? <laughs> well, I'm not, I haven't really uh, thought as much about um, the provincial side, of course, uh, they tend to follow, actually, when it comes on the tax side, they tend to follow uh, federal leadership, uh, I've, I've noticed. Uh, I remember when one of the big debates we had about lowering the corporate tax rate, for example, in, uh, you know, uh, after 2000, was whether the federal, whether the provinces would grab the room and raise their rates and offset the federal ones. Instead, the opposite happened. The, the provinces actually uh, came along and 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 followed through uh, with the same direction as the federal government. Uh, now the provinces do collect more revenue now uh, than the federal government, and of course property taxes are totally a municipal or 
in some provinces a provincial uh, responsibility. And, and there you're seeing a lot of experimentation taking place. I'm not sure it's the best experimentation, but but um, uh, certainly in, in some of the areas they've been doing it. And of course, uh, there's uh, significant reform uh, potentially uh, when it comes to sales taxation, excise taxation in, in the provinces. Uh, and But as long as they follow the tax collection agreements for the GST, uh, for the income tax and for the, um, and both for the personal and the corporate income tax, uh, you know, the federal, uh, federal government really takes a significant lead there in terms of uh, changing the system. And I think, uh, you know, I think that uh, obviously there's gonna be a need for federal provincial coordination uh, of any tax reform uh, to, to move ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, again, I stress we've had a lot of excellent questions, and I apologize in advance for the fact that we're unlikely to get to all of them. Uh, your comments about the uh, GST and the HST certainly struck a chord. Uh, I'll, I'll mention Jeff Trossman. He's not the only person uh, asking about it, but he uh, uh, was wondering if you could say a bit more about how we might be able to uh, get to that broader base uh, that you talked about, because clearly it's politically popular to poke holes in the base. <laughs> no, and, and that's also true for almost every tax, but <laughs> it's always easy to make holes and to uh, fill them up. Um, the, uh, just, to, just to say as a, as a comment, one of, uh, when, when School of Public Policy, and, uh, during the time I was running it, we put out a paper by Mike Smart on GST reform and, and, and looked at the idea of having a broad-based tax, including taxing food. Uh, you should have seen the we had a huge amount of <laughs> reaction to the paper, uh, both positive and negative, but mainly negative, of course. Uh, you know, you can't tax food. Uh, you know, that's horrible. Um, but the thing is about the GST is that in Canada, you know, we've had the low income tax credit, uh, which has been a way of trying to make the system uh, less punitive on, on low income people. You can always bump that up. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think we should, uh, uh, look at a number of exemptions in the system, whether they're actually achieving what they're supposed to achieve. Um, politically, it's very hard because we're talking about food, rent, uh, you know, a number of other things. Um, but again, it's, uh, you know, we've just introduced a new one for rental housing. And my bet is it's not going to be that successful because why will drive up land rents more or land prices more? <laughs> so it's going to be an offset the way that this is the trouble with property uh, when it, when you're dealing with fixed fixed uh, uh, supply of uh, land and so i think uh, i think that we have to uh, i think i think we have to uh, 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 try to look at it we we also know in financial services it's a very messy area uh, in terms of uh, of taxation of uh, uh, under the under the gst hst uh, and uh, and so uh, which a lot of countries have had uh, difficulties with but canada's not the only one uh, but I think I think that uh, the the big question is just like any reform. If we end up reducing the rate, will that be popular enough to uh, to make the base broadening op approaches more uh, uh, possible? Well, thank you. Yes, not an easy question. Uh, thank you. Thank you for addressing that. I'm going to roll two questions together, and not because they completely congruent, but just in, the, in, in order to try and cover the territory. John McNally asks, are there specific tax reforms you recommend to improve investment and producti productivity for SMEs? Specifically, uh, Noel Dean Simon, thoughts on whether the disparity in uh, between the general corporate income tax rate and the small business uh, effective rate um, is, a, is a sensible thing. Should we continue to levy such different effective rates on large and small businesses? Well, I have two very detailed papers on small business taxation that we've done uh, over the years, the latest one uh, just from a few years ago. And every time we've looked at um, uh, the small business tax, you know, what people forget about, uh, and it's not just the, the jump in the corporate rate, but other things as well, is that you end up um, discouraging growth of firms because they end up moving to higher levels of taxation as they grow, grow larger. And so uh, I've, I've argued for a long time that we could have more uh, we could have incentives like accelerated depreciation, um, uh, expensing for for uh, you know as a as a way of uh, of having a growth inducing type incentive rather than a, a growth inhibiting type uh, of incentive. Um, now the other approach which I've recently written about is uh, is this distributed profits tax, which is kind of like what the small business tax has now become uh, in many provinces where you have zero rates and. Uh, 
you know, there's an idea of uh, having a wholesale reform where everybody is not taxed in the retained earnings that they, mo the money that they use in reinvestment of, of, of capital. Uh, and, um, and it's a thought that it's kind of like, you know, having a portfolio where you can replace one asset for another and keep investing, uh, you know, uh, with your retained earnings that, uh, or your income that, uh, that can grow within the portfolio. Uh, without having to bear tax, it's only you, you pay the tax when you take the money out of the corporation, and so I think, um, you know, that is a that would be a very dramatic change, uh, but it also eliminates the difference between small and large firms in a very different way. So uh, I'm of the view that actually uh, we do need to make changes uh, to small business taxation, uh, but uh, the question is, what, what direction do you go? Do you try to Approve the current corporate income tax, which means scaling back um, or, or maybe uh, reintroducing different types of incentives for small businesses. Or do you uh, do something where you give everybody the same sort of um, incentive that small businesses currently get? Well, another very attractive reason to think about that kind of reform, because trying to do something about the small business rate on its own, uh, it's as bad as uh, the uh, the HST base broadening. Um, Sergio Campillo, I'll stay on that topic, actually, because Sergio asks uh, uh, about, it gives you a chance to expand a little on, uh, on, on um, the proposal to tax only distributed profits. Uh, he mentions the risk of double taxation uh, and, and, and the economic distortions from that. So, uh, do you want to just say a bit more about how the proposal would work? Oh, actually, uh, yeah, there wouldn't be uh, double taxation because effectively um, the corporation um, really isn't paying tax um, because uh, uh, it, the, ta the taxes, it's kind of like withholding tax, but the tax is paid when the profits are distributed. Um, and that would be, and then you would have full integration with the personal level uh, if you did that. Uh, the, we did. We, I did work on a full proposal. Uh, you could raise the same corporate tax revenue uh, with a 28% uh, federal provincial corporate income tax on on distributed profits that would be integrated with the dividend tax. Also, I would I would treat under that proposal uh, share buybacks and other distributions as deemed as deemed dividends, and so they would also be subject to the uh, to the tax on distributed profits. Uh, and uh, but uh, but it would be integrated, uh, and then of course uh, uh, the question is the capital gains tax, which uh, uh, would uh, given that you're eliminating the tax on on retained earnings, uh, one could argue that the capital gains tax really should be at the full rate. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Sergio, thank you for the question. I hope you uh, uh, are satisfied with the answer. Or um... Uh, let me just jump. Uh, we're going to run out of time before we run out of questions, unfortunately. But uh, uh, because a couple of questions uh, have come in about property taxation from uh, Almos Desani and from Michael Fenn, um, I, I won't read the questions out because that'll take time. Um, but it's clearly a tough area to reform. Uh, it's municipal budget time, so it's on everybody's minds. And you did touch on it yourself. If you'd like to say a little bit more about um, what, well, actually, Almos mentioned the federal government. Get sticking its fingers into the field as well. So, uh, anyway, over to you. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, you mean property taxation itself in terms of reform of the property tax. Okay. Yes, I th yeah, both of both of them are are talking. I think mainly about uh, municipal the municipal rev revenue angle. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, you know I don't I haven't worked in all provinces and property taxes, so I I don't want to uh, you know talk about all the other things, but we are. Uh, first of all, on the um, land transfer taxes, they are uh, highly distortionary in the sense of taxing mobility. In fact, there's some work done in Australia on the real estate transfer tax there, and it's uh, next to the, at least in the Australian assessment, next to the corporate income tax. It was it had the highest marginal cost of, of, of um, you know, of, of um, uh, highest marginal economic cost per dollar <laughs> of raising revenue. And um, and and so that's why I, I'm particularly concerned about it, and I think that uh, uh, if anything, we're seeing increases to it. But it it is a real cost on mobility, because people have to change uh, locations either for family reasons, because in fact maybe they 
they're downsizing and they're upsizing for family reasons or they have to move for work reasons and, and things like that. And so it does have a significant impact. And also we, we try to apply it on business property, which is easily escaped by business co uh, corporate, you know, by corporations. You set up a little trust to hold the uh, building and then uh, you can avoid entirely the land transfer tax. And we've worked with two provinces on that issue in the past. And I can tell you, they have no clue what's happening in the business sector when it comes to land transfer tax. So it's it's a very it's a very messy field. Um, in terms of the property tax itself, the annual property tax, you know, number of provinces have gone to market value, sort of. Uh, you know, they may provide some, you know, they'll say, okay, it's market value, but then we're going to give you some relief because you're in an old neighborhood and, you know, you get a big increase. We can't do it at one time and that sort of thing. And so you do get some differential rates. Uh, and you may get uh, differential rates across uh, uh, municipalities within a within an area, uh, although you could argue that that might reflect different public services that are being provided. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. But generally, I have uh, less concern about the annual property tax than I do over these new taxes. I recently have been working on the vacant tax, and that is uh, that is highly uh, problematical in the application of it, and will not raise that much revenue. And the Vancouver story is. It, um, if you believe that all the reduction in vacancy, which could happen just because of higher interest rates that make the cost of holding vacant property more expensive, but if you believe that it actually uh, reduced, um, you know, uh, some vacancies and led to more rental housing, the amount of rental housing created is like 0.1% of the total rental stock. I mean, it's like nothing, and yet you've introduced tax with a lot of compliance costs associated with it. So. You know, I think we have to. I think we have to get away from some of these um, kind of uh, extra taxes that don't raise a lot of revenue, but are highly distortionary and complex to to bring in. And then with the annual property tax, I think one of the interesting questions is if you really want to make it progressive, you could always make an annual progressive uh, annual property tax progressive by having a graduated rate system if you really want to go in that direction. So uh, I need to give that idea to <laughs> to politicians that will just raise revenues. But on the other hand, uh, you know, if you're, you know, I think it's better doing that than having all these extra property taxes being uh, being being put on. Then the other big issue, of course, is the differential between non-residential and residential property taxes in a lot of the provinces. And and uh, and that, of course, has uh, some significant impact on on, uh, you know, on on the use of property, uh, uh, especially when you have differences between, let's say, the commercial and the industrial side uh, uh, where uh, where the, those impacts can can come in. Well, thank you. Yeah, the, 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 it's, it's tempting to elaborate more on that. The intuition isn't obvious in, in apparently in some of these cases, but uh, the, the, the marginal effective tax rates imposed uh, by the taxes you just mentioned and by low end transfer taxes are, are, are surprisingly high. Um, we're close to the end, but I've got a couple of questions, including one that came in the chat, incentive problem, but it's the end of the session, so we'll let the misuse of the field go. But about flat taxation and, and the attraction of trying to get the number of rates down, you've already mentioned it. Uh, in, in one context, is that how high on the list of, of desirable features of the system, uh, sort of, you know, directions we should go in, would that be for you to compress the number of rates? Well, I think, uh, you know, it depends, you know, if you're going to a single rate, I think it's, uh, it's, you know, obviously has some uh, uh, good aspects to it, uh, particularly at, under, under the corporate tax, we, you know, we've had nearly two rates, uh, but We've had, you know, we've had a single rate. If you look at some countries, they actually have graduated corporate income tax rates, which encourages all sorts of um, uh, games playing uh, by corporations. Uh, the uh, the uh, when the case in the case of the personal tax, I get. Uh, I think sometimes there's some value to uh, reducing some of the rates uh, when you get these um, too many uh, rates that are introduced in in the personal tax structure. But I haven't really gotten excited that much about whether you have two or one rate. In fact, even with a flat tax rate with an exemption, you have two rates, zero and some other rate. So if you have three rates or four rates, then you know, uh, I don't think you necessarily buy that much simplicity uh, associated with it. Um, to me, the bigger question are the, uh, the special preferences that are always introduced in the system. And so the flat uh, tax concept, I think where it's, I find most appealing is the idea of having uh, lower rates, uh, maybe flatter rates, 
but getting rid of a whole bunch of special exemptions and credits. And so um, uh, I think that's, I think, really the more appealing aspect of the flat tax. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, other things are also easy to communicate. So, uh, well, Jack, we're at 1.30 uh, Eastern time. Uh, uh, and uh, that's as much time as we asked you to commit for and as we asked for uh, the attendees to commit for. So uh, we'll wrap up, uh, notwithstanding, I'm sure I speak for many in the group, uh, notwithstanding the continuing appetite to explore a lot of the issues that you've raised. Um, you always want to leave them wanting more, and uh, uh, with any luck, it won't be long before you uh, are back on a CD house stage of one sort or another, if you're willing. Um, uh, let me just, uh, by way of closing ceremonies, if Mitch is uh, quick with his uh, fingers on the keyboard, he'll advertise a couple of upcoming uh, sessions. Uh, there you go. You, if you haven't had enough of me, you can uh, get me along with Don Drummond. We've got our annual shadow budget coming out. One of the tasks being to create some fiscal room to make the tax changes uh, uh, easier to manage. Uh, and then we've also got something quite different. Uh, but of course, the world is in a fraught state. And uh, it's always useful to look abroad and see what opportunities and challenges uh, are, are for us there. So we'll have Ailish Campbell, uh, our ambassador to the EU, uh, to talk about that. And I hope you got the times and dates because I'm not going to read them out. We have to get back uh, to wrapping up this session. Uh, and it's my pleasure to say, uh, Jack, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming in. And, and those of you who post questions, I'm, I'm glad we were able to get to a lot of them, if not all. Uh, Jack, as I said already, the Mintz Lecture, it's a marquee event in the CD House whose annual calendar, and it's been a treat to feature you at the lecture that's named for you. Thanks very much. That's it, everyone. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.